Welcome to our Ken's Five Originals special. I'm AC Little Metal. Over the next 30 minutes, we are taking a look at the stories that make San Antonio and surrounding areas so unique. From hidden treasures on the south side to teens being lured into a life of crime with often deadly consequences. But first, exclusive video of a dramatic chase for an escaped prisoner. That prisoner eluded authorities for weeks, killing five people along the way. Sue Kalberg brings us a story of the Atascosa County Animal Control Chief who helped law enforcement bring it all to an end. With a disarming smile, Chief Henry Dominguez willingly admits he is Atascosa County's dog catcher. But with more than three decades of law enforcement experience, he's also the guy who was in the right place at the right time doing what he calls God's work. Reviewing video the public's never seen of that fatal gunfight. Let's watch the video and see what happens. Sure. Chief Henry Dominguez says the first time I saw this experience and intuition told him to go to Highway 16 near Potite to catch killer Gonzalo Lopez. In the isolated dark, he saw that white truck officers across Texas were after. I got behind the vehicle and I ran the plates. Because you thought that was a little God thump. Yes, yes, it was a guy telling me, go check. Henry's running that vehicle, that's the vehicle. Lopez had been on the run for 22 days after escaping from a Texas prison transport bus. They say his crime spree continued as he killed five people. A grandpa and grandkids in Centerville, Texas, stole their guns, stole their truck, and then headed for the border. He is armed with an AR-15 and a pistol and a whole bunch of ammo. If someone's willing to, to kill a child, they're willing to kill anybody. And so I knew at that point that we had to stop this guy. Do not get to stop this until plenty of backup is there. Calmly and quietly in an unmarked vehicle, Dominguez fell in behind the truck. He's not driving fast. He's As officers from all over came to the area in a team effort to stop the killing spree. I knew my job was to watch him, to keep him within eyesight to give his location, direction of travel, and speed. As one officer hiding in the dark spiked all four tires, good hit, good hit. they thought the end was near. There's 15 or 20 units in the area yes, ready to take him down when he stops. Correct. Because he's coming into town now. Correct. But instead of stopping, they say Lopez took off across country. Vehicles going in animal control. Headed away from town. Then they say he turned again. Okay, we are 16 southbound, 16 southbound. Toward a neighborhood full of senior citizens, so they said it was time to act. With lights and sirens finally screaming, everyone pounced. We were not gonna let this monster hurt anybody else. Dominguez watched as sparks flew when Lopez took out a power pole. And when he crashed into a fence, bullets started flying. Dominguez says a house a few feet away took some bullets, but everything and everyone else escaped unscathed. Where no officers got hurt, civilians got hurt, and at the end, a bad guy went to hell and we got to go home. The next day, in the daylight, Dominguez says he found a bullet hole in his windshield about a foot away from where his head had been. It was a very close call. Now, afterwards, all of these law enforcement officers got some days off, they got some appreciation gifts, and you know what they did next. They all went right back to work. Dominguez says helping people is his way of honoring his faith in God. In Atascosa County, Sue Kalberg, Ken's Five. Big wads of cash, guns, and an easy profit. Experts say that's the message Mexican drug cartels are sharing on social media to recruit teenagers into the world of human smuggling. But teens quickly find out the dangers of working with criminal organizations bring lifelong consequences. Here's Vanessa Croy with this special report. Fast, furious, and 15. That's the age of the accused human smuggler DPS says led troopers on a high-speed chase in Frio County. We're gonna get you out. 
DPS body cam video showing the dramatic moments. Do you have a hammer? Officers rush to the scene. The 15 year old driver from San Antonio arrested for human smuggling. My friend. Also charged, the passenger DPS says was just 12 years old. Put your hands out the window! DPS video showing the chaos happening on the southwest border over the last year. High speed chases. Speeds of 116. Rollover crashes. And behind the wheel, <laughs> teenagers. Well, when you're a teenager or when you know you have teenagers, they don't think nothing bad's gonna happen. They're invincible. The trend now sparking a growing concern among law enforcement. That's a recipe for disaster. Narcotics. Craig Larrabee is a special agent in charge of Homeland Security San Antonio. He says Mexican drug cartels are actively recruiting teens to smuggle migrants. We see that in smaller vehicles where you're seeing this recruitment of younger people to go use their passenger vehicles or pickup trucks or everything to go pick up uh, migrants and bring them uh, to a, de a different location. No, I was a driver. Last month, DPS says a 15 year old girl was charged with human smuggling after leading troopers on a high speed chase through Hidalgo County. Also charged, the girl's 14 year old brother. What's the was in the car? Some of them are, you know, Maybe they don't even have their license, or they do have the license, they only had a short period of time, and the next thing you know, it could be a disaster. What is the lure for these teens? It's just money. It's just money. I mean, you'll see the ads, there's just, you know, make $1,000, make, uh, $5,000 $5, for one drive. Many of these teens are coming from big cities like San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. And HSI tells us that the criminal organizations are luring the teens to the border using social media. You put it out there and it's shared so many times that you could strike out 99% of the time. All you need is that 1% of the time. And while the teens may think they're signing up for a big payout. It may be easy money for a short term, but the long term consequences, you know, you're, you're, you're bound to get caught. Larrabee says getting caught isn't the only danger the teens are facing. That guy that wanted, he told us to take us or he was going to kill us. They're now entering into an agreement with a transnational criminal organization that may have very bad ties. They don't care about you. Once you're in, it's not easy to get out. You're going to be placed under arrest for smuggling a person. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. Reporting for KINS 5, Vanessa Croy, Eagle Pass, Texas. It is dubbed as a superhero-like tool. The new technology is being used by law enforcement across the country, including in our area. What it does is different during takedowns, and the people behind the technology say it is needed and painless. Henry Ramos puts it to the test. Takedown after takedown. This is new technology being used by law enforcement. It is truly a paradigm shift in law enforcement. It sounds like a gun, but no one is getting shot. Instead, think of it this way. If you think about comic books, it's Spider-Man. Terry Nichols is with Rap Technologies. It is literally a, a small rope being deployed out of a, a, a device that looks like a garage door opener or a stud finder. The technology is one word, Bullerac. It was invented in 2017. And they did it because they saw that the rash of shootings involving law enforcement and specifically those with mental illness. And they said there's got to be a better way, a more humane way of treating people that are ill. Nichols has more than 30 years of law enforcement experience. You look at an officer's duty belt or their vest today and it hasn't changed in 30 years. He was an officer and also used to be the Seguin police chief. This is the first real change you've seen in law enforcement since the invention of the taser. Here's what the bolo wrap looks like up close. It is the size of a phone. Nichols says 1,100 agencies across the U.S. and 63 countries are currently using it. Departments as big as Detroit and Seattle. Here's the bolo wrap. Um, and then I have two sets of handcuffs right here. This year, Seguin police just started using the new tool. We're all learning, but I think it's a great stepping stone from what's been missing. So right now we're gonna see how this is going to work and for our protection because of how loud apparently it is, we're putting these earplugs for safety. Suited in jeans and sweatpants and glasses, I wanted to see how this worked and if you feel anything. So you're gonna go to jail today? No, sir. The officers giving me commands, and then 10 seconds later, I was double wrapped. Here it is in slow motion, the rope spinning at me, wrapping twice around my legs. 
And to be honest, I didn't feel a thing. You can see the rope is tied with the silver hooks that are sharp. Given how loud the sound is, you aren't sure where to look. Nichols says the rope comes out from 10 to 25 feet. The target areas are around the legs or the forearms. Their eyes will immediately look down to see what, what, what just hit me. Okay, and that gives those officers that opportunity to close the distance very quickly and grab them while they're distracted by the noise. Kids 5 obtaining this body camera video from Seguin Police. They say a man had a warrant and officers Stop. chased him here. Officers say he was about to run again until this. Bullet, bullet, bullet. He was wrapped and taken into custody. This is designed for low levels. If there's already a fight going on, officers have tools for that. Nichols says every scenario is different. Less injury for them, less injury for the uh, individuals on the street as well. Now, Nichols says another agency in our area using it is the San Marcos Police Department. Officers do have to go through training. In terms of cost, Nichols says to completely outfit an officer, it could be up to $1,600. Well, these days, artificial intelligence is used for just about everything from self-driving cars to writing essays to creating realistic images that fool the eye. We test out one of those applications, AI headshots. Say cheese. If you've ever had a professional picture taken, you might agree. The process can be painstaking and pricey. So enter a seemingly simple solution, AI headshots. All eyes are on generative AI right now. And I think that is going to be a hot topic uh, for the next uh, 10 years at least. Experts say AI headshots are having their moment, and it's hard to deny their popularity. With so many options, we tried three services for ourselves. Headshot Pro, Try It On AI, and Dreamwave AI. For our test, we relied on a willing newsroom volunteer, Ken's Vibe digital producer, Darcy Ramirez. Each platform works about the same. Upload a series of real photos, pay the fee, then wait for the results. Once we had them, I asked Darcy's cubicle mates, David and Luke, to help analyze the images. You ready to see your results? Yes. Yes? Okay. So the first one we're going to start with is a platform called Headshot Pro. What do we think of Headshot Pro? I don't think they look like me. Especially the different hairstyles, like that one right there kind of looks more like my hairstyle. It felt to me like it was just plopping your head on somebody else's body. The next one is Try It On AI. This was the cheapest of the three platforms. What did you think? I feel like it's definitely AI, but the hair is somewhere I'm like, that is not, I don't feel like I look anything, anything <laughs> like that. If you look really carefully, mm -hmm. there's little intricacies in the photo where you can tell it's clearly AI. Look how the nose is a little separated from her face right here. And some of the eyes too, just uh, maybe they just they just seem a little tired. Our third platform is a platform called Dreamway AI, and they claim to give you AI headshots without the AI look for thirty five dollars. Mm -hmm. And I gotta say, I think of all the platforms that we've mm -hmm. tried, these to me look the most realistic. All of them with the smile is it's pretty close. I think if the eyes are the window to the soul, then Dreamwave is the window to lifelike AI. It could probably most definitely pass as me, especially if you don't see me every day. All in all, the experiment was fun, but Darcy wasn't so impressed with the results, which begs the question, just because someone can use AI headshots, does it mean they should? Chin slightly down. Local branding and marketing experts Alejandra and Jason Bryant say using AI professionally can be a problem. From an employer standpoint, if I'm seeing this image that's not really you, it can compromise the trust that you're trying to build. The Bryants say AI removes authenticity and may even cause someone to question your credibility. If I work so hard on my resume to have something impressive that's taking years to get to this point, why am I now gonna water it down with something that can now taint it as far as being ethical? Aside from the ethics of AI headshots, as we saw with Darcy, the other downside is the accuracy. They just can't capture you quite like a camera. It's like a clone of you, and it doesn't have that same imperfections like uh, a birthmark or a scar. It's not going to have that. 
I want a fresh smile. Don't be giving me. <laughs> the Bryants describe their sessions as a celebration, guiding their clients through the uneasiness of taking a photo to unveil a confident and comfortable you. Are you ready to see your real photo? Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Darcy? I think I would put them on my LinkedIn immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're great. Major developments put a sea of orange in downtown San Antonio. As drivers navigate years of changing traffic patterns and growing congestion, many wonder how long will it take for the work to be done. Our Jessica Coombs maps out the construction and the detours it's made for small business owners. Sights and sounds all too familiar downtown. Wait. It's a pain in the butt. It makes navigating a challenge. Wait. Detours. A lot of zigzagging. Congestion. Wait. People are hitting because they don't know which way to go. It's horrible. It's terrifying. Wait. An irritation as the city struggles to keep up with growth and aging infrastructure. We built uh, this kitchen. Augustine Cortez is one of several business owners who says the city put a roadblock to business. More people are going to lose their jobs more people are going to lose their dreams, their livelihood. 17 downtown projects are in the city's five-year program. When you come to work overnight, there's an eight-foot fence in front of your front door. Augie made it through the pandemic, but he says construction forced him to permanently close his Broadway barbecue joint. There was nowhere to get here. Four years later, the work wraps up this summer. New streets, sidewalks, and bike lanes will bring customers. But Augie says there was no warning. I've got open statements from uh, local city officials that told me we messed up. We should have warned and, re and reminded and talked to you about what was going to happen. That was a really key piece of feedback that we got was we're not finding out about these projects until there's construction equipment on our street. Downtown Southside is a changing maze of cones for the South Alamo Bond Project. What's the best intersection has become the worst intersection to be at. Opening a pizzeria at Hemisphere was a dream for Lori Horn and her husband, but they weren't expecting this. He called me and he said, hey, Lori, did you know there's a huge hole in front of your restaurant? Their plan hit a detour. People just don't want to deal with the hassle of trying to get here and get home. It's forced us to close our business two days a week. Complications have now pushed the project's deadline to 2025. I'm afraid that in 2025, are we going to hear, ah, it's going to go now into 2026. The city says most work takes one to two years. What they dig up and the weather can change those time frames. If the project is late because of unknown condition, we didn't know what's there, contractor didn't know, then we work with contractor and we provide them additional days. Online tools point businesses towards resources and updated timelines. We also have available a signage program for our small businesses. Lori says signs are a good start, but the city needs to do more to reroute customers. We need help not only with signage, with social media, with campaigns, advertising campaigns. New QR codes pull up paths around construction, but is it too much of a hassle? The convention attendees, the exhibitors, the visitors, they see a sign that says road closed. Why would they walk down that street? The city is trying to help. Businesses located um, within 500 feet of these long-term city-initiated projects lasting at least 12 months based on their losses, would be able to qualify for up to $35,000 in funds. But those extra funds came too late for some. I feel for the people who have closed. I mean, we got very, very close ourselves. How long will customers wait? I mean, I'm sure it's going to be real pretty once it's done. Kind of annoying right now. Wait. And how long can business owners? It's not just the business that's hurting. What about their personal home? What about their employees? Wait. When will it end? The answer depends on who you ask. Jessica Coombs, Ken's Five. People are flocking to San Antonio from other cities, states, and even countries. Jeremy Baker met with long-term developers. They say there is a small chance San Antonio and Austin will grow into a major metropolitan area. 
Alice has a population of about 1.3 million people. 32 miles to the west, Fort Worth has 950,000. That entire Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex boasts over 7.5 million residents altogether. They had a long established track history of working together, but they're also 16 counties large um, in their transportation planning area. And so they've had decades of experience working with each other. Head south on I-35 and you'll find Austin with a population of close to a million and 73 miles away sits San Antonio with about one and a half million. That emerging San Antonio Austin metro area as a whole totals about five million people. But with both cities exploding in numbers, could we see Austin and San Antonio grow together just like Dallas and Fort Worth? Let's find out. You would have to see equal commuting between Austin and San Antonio or New Braunfels and San Marcos in order for them to be considered the same metropolitan area. So far that hasn't happened, but it hasn't stopped planning in San Antonio when it comes to new developments, roads, water and electricity. Areas where there are currently jobs or there are projected to be future jobs uh, in those areas, they're considered employment centers or growth centers. And we would like to see more residential growth in those areas and hopefully reduce the pressure that could be experienced in some of our existing neighborhoods. Part of our planning process is that we have diversified our water supply. So we used to be only on Edwards Aquifer water. Now we have water from seven different sources, 13 different water projects. But SAWS is not just diversifying for the future, but also stressing conservation. And conservation also gets us to uh, lower demand for the future. And so that helps balance out the, the need for new supplies, while at the same time, the need for new infrastructure. But what about the roads? The Alamo Area Metropolitan Planning Organization is already planning on double-decker highways on the north side of San Antonio to keep traffic moving as the city grows. But usage of highways will ultimately determine if Austin and San Antonio grow together. But because the two cities are more than 70 miles apart, Hall says the chance of them growing as one is rather low. Right now for Austin and San Antonio being over an hour apart on a good day, it's going to be really difficult for those regular commuting patterns to develop. For more info on long-term growth plans from these city entities to handle the extreme growth, we have plenty of links with this story on Kens5.com. Jeremy Baker, Kens5. Have you ever wondered what could be buried underneath your home? People are finding treasures from the turn of the century underground. As our Alicia Neaves learned, while these discoveries may not be worth millions, it's the stories they tell that are priceless. In one of the oldest neighborhoods in San Antonio. We are in La Vaca neighborhood. Adam Alvarado was doing some gardening when he found something unusual. It's probably the very early 1900s. A coin with an inscription he didn't recognize. It just says, uh, John Brady's Parlor Bar, I owe you one drink. The John Brady Saloon was located in the Solomon Deutsch Building in Main Plaza, sitting face to face with San Fernando Cathedral. It was a bustling business that shut down during Prohibition. No more than a thousand were probably made, from what I'm told. So it definitely sparked my curiosity to what else could be lying underneath our yard here. <laughs> that same interest fueled Sean Ward's favorite pastime. I'm what I call an expert hobbyist. My grandfather was a coin collector and he got me interested in that hobby. Using a wireless metal detector, headphones and a pinpointer, he explores historic neighborhoods across town, chasing the sound of his next discovery. Uh, Indian Headpenny, 1879. I had uh, some Mexican one centavos from the 1880s. I found a Civil War musket ball, Civil War mini ball. We had to tag along as he searched two properties in the Monticello Park Historic District. Home to many prominent families back in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Jason Vasquez, vice president of the Jefferson Neighborhood Association, says the movers and shakers of San Antonio ruled this neighborhood. The house next door was the home of the Lucchese family, of the Lucchese Boot Company. This home here was the home of the Orsinger family, which had some of the first auto dealerships for San Antonio back in the 20s, 30s. 
With a crowd like that, surely we'd find something. So it's called a coin spill. We did. Several coins. The oldest, a 1941 wheat cent. Anything of value I'd like to know about, yes. Uh, or anything of interest I'd like to know about. Our second property in Monticello Park belongs to David McElmore. I lived in this home for 27 years. He says it's the former bishop's home of the Southwestern Conference of the Methodist Church, built in 1935. Floyd Curl was very active in, in creation of the Southwest, South Texas Medical Center hence the name of the street that goes into the medical center. They lived here for quite a while. A quick scan through the front and backyard, over a spot where a swimming pool used to be, a few more coins signaled us underground. How much are they worth? I found a, a, an old Seated Liberty dime recently, 1890. How much that one was worth? maybe in the 30 or $40 range. Back in Lavaca, Adam got an estimate for the value of his coin from the saloon. Even in this condition, it's probably worth about $100 to $125. He decided to keep it. To Adam, the true value will be much more than dollars and cents. Maybe hang it on the wall or something like that so that it's a conversation piece for sure. Alicia Neyavis, Ken Spy. We've all lost something at one time or another that means something to us. Sometimes we find it, sometimes you don't, and sometimes others do. This is a story about a quest that began over 5,000 miles from San Antonio more than six decades ago. Barry Davis has the story. You know, it was just like, well, let me look into that again. Ed Lee has been looking for 62 years. Now 92, Lee was a 20-something-year-old airman stationed at Giebelstadt Army Airfield in Germany, which coincidentally was the home base of the famed U-2 spy plane. While out one day, something caught Lee's eye. I looked down on the ground and there was a ring there and I picked it up. It was a 1959 class ring from the University of Pennsylvania. Inside, the initials R-E-S. As hard as the young sergeant looked on base, he couldn't find the owner. Nobody knew anybody that had lost a class ring. So Lee put the ring away. Over the years, though, he'd come across it every now and then. I would always think, if it was me, I'd like to have my ring back. He tried repeatedly to find the owner, but every time he'd hit a dead end, he even reached out to the University of Pennsylvania several times. Uh, they would tell me, oh, that's not in my department or something to that effect. Lee eventually retired from the Air Force and ended up the fire chief at Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio. He also took up the hobby of making his own jewelry. I've been tempted many times to go ahead and, and melt this a uh, ring, but I just never could bring myself to do it, you know. There was something on which Lee just couldn't quite put his finger. A U.S. college ring found on German soil with a missing owner. He um, had a passion for engineering and electronics, um, could really fix anything. He was Scott is the son of Kay and Robert Edwards Sauvageau, R E. S. There's no family history of knowing about him having a class ring or what it could have happened to it. Bob, to his friends, was born in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1931. He had the normal American childhood, played football in high school, then enlisted in the U.S. Navy. I think he sort of found his passion for electronics and electrical engineering in the Navy, working on radar and IFF equipment, um, identification for info equipment. Remember that reference to the U-2 spy plane program? After the Navy, Bob used the GI Bill to get his degree in electrical engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. He did work exclusively for defense contractors, so that would have been from 1960 after graduating um, all the way through the end of his career in the, the 90s. Bob and Ed were on the same base at the same time, but never met. This ring belongs to an individual that worked hard to get it, and that I would love to be the one to get it back to that individual. They'll never meet, not in this world. Bob passed away in 2019.
I knew that there was a possibility that the individual would not be with us anymore any longer. Well, then it would go to his family. Elise Betts, the executive director of UPenn's Alumni Association, helped make that happen. After confirming they were 99% sure that ring belonged to Bob, Ed gave it to me, and we flew to Laurel, Maryland to take it home. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. That's amazing. I, I, I'm, I'm really in awe. This is, this is just incredible. Scott says his father never spoke about being in Germany, but then he never really talked much about his work. A lot of his work was in guidance systems and radar development. So it's very possible that he was doing um, classified work for the DOD. We may never know for sure how it got there. And in the end, it doesn't really matter. Does it fit? Oh, I'm sure it won't fit my fingers. Actually, yeah, it does. Wow, well, it does. That's, that's interesting. This is, this is truly amazing. What does matter is the ring's journey is over. I just hope that the uh, son of the individual will take it and cherish it and... For Ed Lee... Just love it. Mission accomplished. Barry Davis, Ken's Five. Hitting play after a long pause, two Tejano music talents are back under the bright lights. Jennifer Peña has returned to the big stage. Who else is back? The Tejano supergroup, very popular in the 90s, Culturas. Henry Ramos chats it up with both acts. Taking it back in time, the early 90s, the peak for Tejano music. The beats, the catchy tunes. The crowded concerts, the energy was electric, like the performances on stage. But in order to go back in time, we had to roll out and dust off the Kins 5 archives. Jennifer Beckett presents Jennifer Benya y los Jets. 12 year old Jennifer Benya, the then young star known as the Tejano Princess, commanded the stage with her talent. In the early 90s, Banya was said to be the next Selena. At the time, Kins 5 spoke to her on different occasions. She made one thing clear. I'm not the next Selena. I want to be known as Jennifer Banya. Banya went on to have a stellar career with hit after hit becoming an international star until she went on a very long pause. What has Jennifer Banya been up to? In those 13 years, in those 13 years, I was a stay-at-home mom, expanding my family. I... For more than a decade, she focused on being mom. She's now a mother of five. Was there always that itch to, like, come back? I was content at home with my family. Um, I was fulfilled in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, obviously was something missing, right? Because the first opportunity I got, I'm like, hey, like, <laughs> I'm back. Go. I won't come back. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Banya is back. She doesn't call it a comeback, but more of a return. I was born to be a mother, but being on stage is part of what I was born to do. It's part of my destiny. Another throwback that is back on play that the Hano show stomping group Culturas, the high energy band's front runners, Delia Gonzalez and Dee Burleson. Through the years, they've always been after us come back, at least do one more. When are you gonna get together? And we finally said, you know what? We still got one more in this, why not? Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. We chatted with the group in the same studio where they made their first album in 1992. And now in 2024, their latest album's fitting title, 9224. It's not like a comeback. We're not trying to do a comeback. It's just a project. Let's rewind back to the 90s. The band was big. They were recognized as show band of the year. Delia and Dee had a chemistry on stage that was untouched. There are people right around Henry's age. You know, they were in diapers when their, their abuelas were, were dancing to culturas. And so now you wonder, they've been told this legend 
about you know this legendary band and we were just a band having fun the two were quick to say they are not going on tour but will do upcoming shows we're just happy that we are able to just do it one more time even though time has passed for these two acts the love remains for the music and the love for their fans. Our fans tell us that we're great. It's just, to, to us, it's just, this is what we do. Only God knows what my future holds, but I'm I'm going full force with everything and enjoying every everything he has in store for me. Tens of millions of scratch-off tickets are bought in Texas every year. As we've seen recently in our area, some strike it rich, while most losing tickets often go into the trash. But as Jeremy Baker reports, some of those tickets have an extra chance to win. And the lottery says many don't know about it. It's called the Second Chance Lotto, or the Luck Zone. If you don't win a prize on the front of the ticket, don't toss it out. On the back is another chance for you to hit it big. It just takes a little more work. If a player plays one of those tickets and they have a non-winning ticket, so they don't win a cash prize on the scratch ticket, then they can go again to the website or to the mobile app enter a certain code from that ticket on to the site. And within a few weeks, that player could be notified that they are a huge second chance winner. There's no reason not to. If you already bought your ticket and you didn't win that primary prize, then definitely enter it. Meet Jeff <laughs> and his good friend Michelle and Rick <laughs> and his niece Mandy. Both pairs love scratch off lottery tickets. And unlike many of us, after scratching away the entire card, came up with nothing. But unlike many lottery players, they didn't just stop there and throw away the card. They flipped those cards and entered the luck zone, a second chance lotto, and came away big time winners. I buy them because there's second chances and there's only a handful and not all of them are second chance. There was other prizes and, and things and just happened to win the top prize. That top prize, a trip to see Luke Combs, thanks to the living lucky with Luke Combs $10 scratcher. Rick Leal got to go too. It was great. They were very good hosts. Uh, the accommodations were fine other than the work that was being done on the hotel. But they treated us like royalty. It was really a lot of fun. A $13,000 all expenses paid trip. Not a bad haul for spending 10 bucks. Each scratch off ticket entered in the luck zone drawing can be used only one time. Once you fill out the back and send it in, you don't have to keep the rest of the ticket. You can throw it away so you don't have to keep track of it. And you can enter any luck zone drawing as many times as you wish, but you have to buy a new scratcher every time. Our winner's advice about playing the second chance games. It's a free chance to win something else. A lot of people just discard those tickets. I don't want them to do it. Less people no. enter, it's more chance more for you. More chances for us to win. <laughs> to find out more about the Luck Zone and your second chance at winning, we have a link to the Texas Lottery website with this story on Kens5.com. Jeremy Baker, Kens5. We hope you've enjoyed the special presentation of Kens 5's original community news coverage. There's even more to explore by heading over to Kens5.com slash original.